Amen. Let's bow. And Lord, we just thank you for Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you bless our time together tonight as we study more about our friend, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord. Lord, decrease me that you would increase in our eyes, Lord. And we pray for vibrant discussion in the groups. And we pray that you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, brothers, welcome to the best place to be on Monday night. Bible Study Fellowship right here at uh, Faith Bible Church in DeSoto, Texas. Also on Tuesday night at uh, the Avenue in Waxahachie, my name is Deron Hill. I am your teaching leader, and I am also my brother's keeper. And brothers, I just want to encourage you, let's finish the year strong. Let's invite more men, and uh, let's not get caught with that disease called spring fever. So uh, let's make sure we finish on a strong note. We only have a few weeks left. All right. Uh, announcements. Brothers, uh, I want to encourage you. I mean, it's that time. Are you ready for some baseball? Baseball, hot dog, apple pie, and Chevrolet. I mean, remember that old commercial? <laughs> well, I don't know about the Chevrolet part, but we're going to have a great time Saturday with baseball, the Rangers, fellowship, and a lot of good food. So, uh, brothers, I want to encourage you to uh, carpool to the game. Uh, and uh, also for the men who attend who are not in Bible study fellowship, I want to encourage you to invite them to join us on Monday uh, and the rest of this and the rest of our study. And then perhaps they'll even come back and join us in uh, for our study in Revelation uh, in September. Our say so night is going to be on May the 6th. So just make sure we remember that. And again, Revelation begins on September the 9th. All right. BSF does depend on your financial support. So if the Lord is uh, guiding you or leading you to uh, donate, you can give by either of the methods on the screen, either by dropping some cash in the basket, sending a check in the mail to headquarters, using the QR code, or online. All right. Um, if you have not done so, brothers, go ahead and open your Bibles to our text for tonight. We are still in the book of John, where we've been all year, uh, chapter 18, uh, beginning in verse 28. Our subject sentence for tonight's text, Jesus faces trials and is sentenced to die. Jesus faces trials and is sentenced to die. Our aim is to cause the audience to learn that the rejection of the truth of Jesus is the acceptance of a lie. The rejection of the truth of Jesus is the acceptance of a lie. Our divisions, we have two divisions, verses 28 through 40 of chapter 18 is our first division. Our second division, 19 uh, verses 1 through 16, that's our final division. All right, brothers, let's go ahead and dive into our text for tonight. And our text tonight actually begins with what has been a very long night for Jesus. It is now very early in the morning, just before daybreak, because that's when the rooster crows. Jesus has been before Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, but under Roman law, they lacked the legal authority to carry out capital punishment. Uh, additionally, they did not want to break this law during Passover when there would be so many people present. So the Jewish religious leaders sought the approval of the Roman government to carry out Jesus' execution. And the first thing we see in John 18, verse 28 is their hypocrisy. Now, we are told as they led Jesus to Governor Pilate, they did not enter the governor's headquarters because they did not want to make themselves unclean and be unable to participate in the Passover. They did not want to defile themselves. Now, they were completely fine with killing Jesus on this day, but they could not enter the governor's headquarters. So they wanted to maintain the appearance of being clean on the outside, even if murder was on, in their hearts on the inside. So clearly they sent someone in to wake up Pilate. Now John does not mention this, but Matthew 27 verse 3 tells us that as Jesus was being brought before Pilate, Judas had a change of heart. As he saw Jesus being brought before Pilate, he rushed back to the chief priests and returned the money that they had given him to betray Jesus. Judas told them, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Judas left and committed suicide, thereby sealing his eternal fate. He died as an unforgiven sinner. 
In John 18, 29, Pilate asked the Jewish leaders what charge they had against Jesus. Now, John does not record an answer that rose to the level of a criminal charge. In verse 30, John records the people saying, if this man were not a criminal, would we have handed him over to you? They're basically saying, Pilate, trust us. He's a criminal. And Pilate was able to read between the lines. They had not really presented formal charges against Jesus. So Pilate said, you take him and and judge him according to your law. And then the Jewish leaders made their intent clear to Pilate. They wanted Jesus executed. They said, it's not legal for us to put him to death. So now Pilate was unnoticed that although they had not articulated a crime that Jesus had committed, for some reason these folks wanted Jesus dead. And Roman capital punishment for non-Roman citizens was death by crucifixion. And apparently, although John does not record it, someone told Pilate that Jesus claimed that he was the king of the Jews. Because this is the precise question that Pilate asked Jesus when he went back inside to talk to Jesus. Pilate's interaction with Jesus was his come and see moment, his opportunity to come to know the Savior of the world. He will be given enough information to act on if he exercises just a little faith. He asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Nowhere has Jesus proclaimed that he was the king of the Jews. In fact, after he fed the 5,000, Jesus withdrew from the crowd because they wanted to make Jesus king by force. Jesus has been very careful to keep this title on the wraps. Others have declared that Jesus is the king. Remember, this is all occurring in Jerusalem only five days after Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey as the crowd shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. There had also been a lot of talk in the region about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. People from all over the region, including the Greeks, they came to Jerusalem to meet Jesus. Jesus' notoriety had spread far beyond the borders of the Jewish people, and he was likely known at least by name and reputation among the Roman political establishment because Matthew even tells us about a dream that Pilate's wife had about Jesus. So Jesus had another question for Pilate. He asked him, are you asking if I am king of the Jews on your own or because what other folks have told you? Jesus goes straight to Pilate's heart. In other words, Pilate, do you want to know who I am so that you can charge me with a crime or so that you can have a relationship with God through me? Pilate does not answer Jesus' question, but his response makes it clear that he had no interest in knowing Jesus as God's representative. In verse 35, Pilate said, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate makes it clear that to him, this was between Jesus and the Jewish people. In Pilate's mind, this had no implication beyond Jesus and his accusers. But Jesus tosses Pilate a lifeline of truth to let Pilate know that he is so much more significant than a mere king of the Jews. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom is otherworldly. He says, okay, you know the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Medes, the Persians, the Romans, and all of these kingdoms over the ages? My kingdom is not like one of those. My kingdom is on a whole different level. In fact, if I had a regular old earthly kingdom like you all, my servants would be fighting and I would have soldiers fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews and then to you. But my kingdom is not from this world. By these words, Jesus is letting Pilate know that my kingdom is so different that I do not even have to resist this unlawful arrest of this mere earthly kingdom. Jesus tossed Pilate a softball, and Pilate took a swing and missed. The next logical question would have been, so explain to me where your kingdom is from. That question from a sincere heart of Pilate may have changed the trajectory of human history. But of course, our all-knowing, 
our sovereign God knew before Pilate was even born the direction that Pilate would take and prophecy would be fulfilled because Pilate will reject the truth of Jesus' words. Instead, Pilate has a completely different motive. His motive in part seems to be to agitate the Jewish leaders who brought Jesus to him and woke him up not long after the rooster crowed. In fact, if you read all four gospel accounts of Jesus before Pilate, Mark tells us that Pilate knew that the Jewish leaders were jealous of Jesus. And if you notice in all of the accounts, Pilate never refers to Jesus by name. He stirs up the Jewish leaders by calling Jesus the king of the Jews repeatedly. So Pilate responds to Jesus telling Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world with these words. So you are a king then. Again, Jesus responds with a softball that will test Pilate's heart. He said, you say that I am a king. I was born for this and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. And he adds, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Again, we don't know what Pilate had heard about Jesus, but Jesus knew, and based on what Jesus knew was in Pilate's heart and mind, Jesus responded in a way that would give a heart that was open to the truth an opportunity to come and see. In other words, Pilate, if you are of the truth, you will listen to Jesus. But Pilate takes another swing and another miss. The brother is about to strike out. This time, he asked the right question, but he asked it in a seemingly rhetorical way. He did not really want a response. In verse 38, he simply said, what is truth? And I say he asked it in a rhetorical way because he did not even wait for a response, nor did he demand a response. John does not record a response from Jesus. Instead, Pilate asked this question, and then immediately he left Jesus and returned to the Jewish leaders. Pilate's question regarding truth reflects the opinions of many people today, and that is that truth cannot be known or that truth is relative. Truth is changing, and truth is different from person to person. Had he waited for a response from Jesus, we already know what Jesus proclaimed in John 14, 6, Jesus is the truth. The truth of Scripture, the truth about our Oh, our holy God and sinful mankind and how great that chasm is, is and how that chasm is bridged in Christ alone. That's not a relative or subjective truth. The truth is we are all sinners before a holy God and he has a perfect standard that none of us are capable of meeting. So he sent his sinless son to die a death that he did not deserve so that those who place their faith in Jesus can have an eternal relationship with God because through the blood of Jesus, the sins of believers are forgiven. That's not my truth. That's not your truth. It is objective biblical truth. But Pilate was not interested in what Jesus had to say about truth. Pilate was face to face with the truth. Pilate was like people today who hear or read the gospel but only ignore it. He walked out on the truth. He returned to the Jewish leaders and told them that he found no fault in Jesus. He had no legal grounds to charge Jesus. Jesus had committed no crime. So Pilate knew that Jesus claimed to be a king from another realm, that he came into the world to tell the truth. He also knew that Jesus was innocent of any crimes. So Pilate wanted to release Jesus. Of course, Pilate was the Roman authority, and Pilate offered the Jewish leaders a compromise. Apparently, in the spirit of Passover and the forgiveness of sins, there was a custom of Pilate pardoning one Jewish prisoner, and since this was Passover, Pilate offered to release Jesus per that custom. In verse 39, Pilate offered to release the king of the Jews. But calling Jesus the king of the Jews only infuriated the crowd even more. They demanded the release of a man named Barabbas, who John says was a revolutionary. The crowd then, like people today, they chose darkness over the light. They chose unrighteousness over righteousness. They chose a, they chose a lie over the truth. And that brings us to our principle. And that is rejecting biblical truth subjects us to all kinds of evil. Rejecting biblical truth 
subjects us to all kinds of evil. The events of this day reveal a Judas who rejected truth and betrayed Jesus. He got his money, but not the peace to enjoy it. His rejection of, rejection of truth ultimately led him to commit suicide. We have the men who arrested Jesus and brought him before Annas and Caiaphas, and now Pilate. They rejected the truth that Jesus was from God in spite of seeing Jesus miraculously heal the ear of Malchus after Peter cut it off. They brought Jesus before the authorities anyway. And we see the Jewish religious leaders completely ignore the prophetic scriptures and the signs that Jesus performed as well as his teachings. And their persistent rejection of the truth led them to try to kill Lazarus, who Jesus raised, and now Jesus himself. And now we see Pilate. Now, in his defense, Pilate was not a Jew. He probably did not know all of the prophetic scriptures but it's hard to imagine that he had not heard a lot about Jesus. And as he questioned a beaten and battered Jesus who proclaimed that his kingdom was not of this world and realized that Jesus was innocent of any crime, it is hard to imagine that he would not simply release this innocent Jesus. Jesus gave Pilate softball after softball, but his heart was not into learning the truth. And Matthew 27, 19 gives us a little bit more information. Pilate was given yet one more chance to see Jesus from a different perspective. As he is offering to release Jesus per the Passover custom of the day, Pilate's wife sent word to him. Now, this was early in the morning after the rooster crowed. As Jesus was being arrested and brought before Annas and Caiaphas and going through all of the makeshift trials and everything that he went through during the night, Pilate's wife was having nightmares about Jesus. She told Pilate, have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I have suffered terribly in a dream because of him. So Pilate's wife reached the conclusion that Jesus was a righteous man, meaning Jesus had a right relationship with God. Jesus was no criminal. Pilate does not condemn Jesus. In fact, he does not, uh, he does not uh, bring any harm to him or does not want to bring any harm to him. Scripture does not tell us this, but I imagine that Pilate's wife had a gift whereby she would receive uh, revelation or truth through, through dreams. So through a warning from his wife, Pilate would be given yet another opportunity to do the right thing related to Jesus. Luke gives us even another piece of information that John does not record. King Herod was in town, and in Luke 23, 7, Pilate, for a few minutes, sent Jesus to be interrogated by Herod. Herod asked Jesus questions, but Jesus had nothing to say to King Herod. Herod was exceedingly evil. He married his brother's wife. And when John the Baptist criticized him for it, he locked John the Baptist up and ultimately had John the Baptist beheaded. So this guy was into Jesus. Herod rejected truth from John the Baptist, and his heart had not changed. Luke tells us that Herod had heard about Jesus performing miracles, and Herod and Pilate became friends that day. So I imagine that Herod also shared with Pilate what he knew about Jesus. But Pilate's heart had not accepted Jesus for who he is. So in spite of seeing an innocent, beaten Jesus, in spite of the words of Jesus being a king of a kingdom that is not of this world, despite Jesus' testimony of the truth, in spite of warnings from his wife, and in spite of whatever other information that Pilate had heard about Jesus from Herod and from anyone else, his ultimate rejection of the truth of Jesus subjected Pilate to follow the whims of these evil Jewish leaders. Because he refused to stand on the truth, he fell for the evil these men had in their hearts for Jesus. He fell for the lie of the culture. He supported the lie that Jesus was a common criminal who should be either part punished or pardoned. And that is precisely what happens when we reject truth. We open the door to the natural consequences or results of the lies of the culture. And that brings us to our application question. And that is... How do you answer the question, what is truth? How do you answer the question that Pilate asked, what is truth? Well, brothers, there are only two teams, the righteous and the unrighteous. 
the godly and the ungodly, those who have a right relationship with God and those who do not. Rejecting truth is not merely rejecting a concept or an idea. It's not merely expressing an opinion. Jesus is the truth. So rejecting biblical truth is rejecting Jesus. And how you answer this question is the foundation for how you lead your life. For Judas, money was the truth. And he sacrificed everything, even sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He wound up committing suicide. Annas and Caiaphas, as the high priest, they rejected the truth and went down in history as the final Jewish authorities to lead Jesus to the cross. They ignored the truth of fulfilled prophecy and the signs that Jesus performed, and they led the entire nation of Israel astray. For Pilate, his position as governor, to him, that was the truth. He would be forever etched in Scripture as the man who rejected truth and served up an innocent Jesus to men he knew had murderous motives. But there was one person there who made out pretty good on this not-so-good Friday. Between the four gospel accounts, Barabbas is described as a murderer, a revolutionary, and a notorious criminal. He had been condemned to die for crimes that he had committed. Barabbas represents each and every one of us apart from Jesus. We are sinners, walking dead men. But like with Barabbas, Jesus made the great exchange for everyone who places their faith in him. We are pardoned of our sins and rebellion, and Jesus died in our place so that we can have life. So you can call me Barabbas because Jesus died for a revolutionary like me. Now, for those who were of the truth, for those who followed Jesus, this was a difficult day. I imagine that John was still watching these various proceedings that will end with Jesus nailed to a cross. But those faithful followers of the truth will have amazing joy come Sunday when Jesus gets up out of that grave. But those who suppress the truth will continue trying to suppress it. And that brings us to our next division. Chapter 19 begins with Pilate having Jesus flogged. And because the people told Pilate that Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, the Roman soldiers made a makeshift uh, crown of thorns and put it on Jesus' head along with a purple robe. They mocked Jesus and his otherworldly kingdom, and they slapped Jesus. I speculate that Pilate had hoped that the flogging, the mocking, and the abuse of Jesus might be enough to appease his accusers. Perhaps Jesus' accusers would back away from demanding his death and accept this cruel treatment as a substitute adequate punishment. Apparently, Pilate did not have the integrity to make the right decision on his own. So after offering to release Jesus per the annual custom at Passover, after that did not work, he tried the flogging and mocking of Jesus. And Pilate, in true hypocritical fashion, in, verse, uh, in chapter 19, verse 4, he took Jesus out to his accusers and told the people that he had no grounds to charge Jesus. Then he presented Jesus before them wearing this purple robe and a crown of thorns. And Pilate proclaimed, here is the man. At that moment, Pilate had decided to release Jesus back to his Jewish accusers because Pilate was not going to charge Jesus. But in verse 6, we see just how wicked the heart can become. The crown of thorns bringing pain, agony, and likely blood running down Jesus' face, plus his wounds from being flogged, did not garner any sympathy in these hard hearts. Beginning with the chief priests, Annas and Caiaphas, and the temple servants who served under their charge, they began to shout out, crucify him, crucify him. Each time that Pilate came out and told them he had no grounds to charge Jesus, Jesus was, uh, uh, God was giving Annas and Caiaphas another chance to soften their hearts and to see Jesus for who he is. And I imagine Pilate must have been considering what his wife told him. And he told them, you take him and crucify him yourself. I find no grounds to charge him with a crime. Then the crowd told Pilate that Jesus violated Jewish law by claiming that he was the Son of God. And in verse 8, we learn that Pilate was afraid, but this claim that Jesus was the Son of God made him even more afraid. Now, that's a good thing. 
I mean, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it will become very apparent that Pilate's fear was not of the Lord. It was fear of a possible uprising by these Jewish leaders, and Pilate wanted no part of that. He had a greater fear of men than he did of God. But Pilate went back in and asked Jesus again, where are you from? Now, Jesus has already told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. And this time, Jesus decided not to respond to Pilate. I imagine the crown of thorns and the flogging did not put Jesus in a talkative mood. Um, although he is the son of God, he is still the son of man. He is still flesh. Pilate had heaped nothing but guilt upon his own head by brutalizing a man that he knew was innocent. And Jesus, knowing Pilate's heart, at this point, refrained from answering him. Then Pilate decided to flex his power by reminding Jesus that, Pil that Pilate had the authority to release or crucify him. And in verse 11, Jesus told Pilate that the only power that he had was given to him from above. And this is why no one or if the ones who handed Jesus over to Pilate had the greater sin. And even though Pilate will ultimately order Jesus' execution, Caiaphas and Annas had greater sin culpability. They were the high priests. And one exclusive function of the high priest was to annually go into the holiest part of the temple and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the nation. Well, by serving Jesus up to the Roman authorities with the chance of crucify him, Caiaphas and his father-in-law Annas would be unknowingly offering Jesus, the Lamb of God, to forever atone for the sins of the world. Jesus was not speaking like an ordinary person appearing in court facing the death penalty. Men on trial in their death penalty cases generally don't talk about the sins of their captors. His words would not pierce Pilate's heart, but they apparently caused Pilate to ponder and consider everything that he had learned about Jesus. Because verse 12 tells us that Pilate began trying to release Jesus. Now, John is being nice to Pilate. He had the authority. If he really wanted to release Jesus, he could have just released Jesus. But Pilate wanted to release Jesus in a way that appeased Jesus' enemies. And nothing short of Jesus' public execution would suffice. Then Jesus' enemies turned up the, heart on, the heat on Pilate. They accused Pilate of not being true to Caesar because Jesus cl claimed to be a king. And in so doing, Jesus was opposing Caesar. Of course, Pilate was appointed by Caesar to be governor in this region. Keeping the people in line was part of Pilate's responsibility, and an uprising might lead, Pilate, might lead uh, Caesar to conclude that Pilate was not the right man for the job. So Pilate, according to verse 13, brought Jesus outside as Pilate sat on the judgment seat. Verse 14 tells us it was about noon. So assuming the rooster crowed just before daybreak, Jesus has been through this several makeshift hearings and trials over the past uh, six hours. And in verse 14, Pilate once again tried releasing Jesus back to the Jews without condemning him to die. He told the people, here is your king. Pilate, in his sarcasm of calling Jesus their king, presented a defining moment for the nation of Israel, represented by the chief priests and the people present. They could accept or reject Jesus as king. And despite only five days earlier, his triumphal, uh, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem to the chance of Hosanna to the highest, he was called blessed and the king of Israel. In spite of being anointed by Mary with ointment worth a year's salary, in spite of being the sinless son of God and soon to be savior of the world, these people made the decision to reject the truth of Jesus. These people embraced the lie that Jesus was a criminal worthy of death, and they began to chant, once again, crucify him. At that moment, these representatives of the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as king and deemed him worthy of death by crucifixion. Not one person, not one believer, not John, not Peter. Well, we know they were there following Jesus' trials, not Nicodemus, not Nick at night, not any person Jesus had healed, delivered, or fed. No one spoke up for Jesus. Any believers present exercised their right to remain silent as their and our Lord faced baseless accusations and his life hung in the balance. 
And despite Pilate's half-hearted effort to save Jesus as he heard the influential chief priests demand Jesus' crucifixion and pledge their loyalty to Caesar, Pilate decided to hand Jesus over to be crucified. He did not listen to his wife. He did not listen to Jesus. He did not listen to his fears. He caved to political pressure. Why did he do this? Well, apparently, Pilate did not know this principle. And that is, biblical truth provides a standard by which all reality must be measured. Biblical truth provides a standard by which all reality must be measured. In Pilate, we do not have a man who was an active enemy of Jesus. He did not hate Jesus. He did not want to crucify Jesus. He repeatedly told Jesus' accusers that there was no legal basis to charge Jesus with a crime. He did not hate Jesus like his accusers did, but because he did not embrace the truth of who Jesus is, Pilate lacked a true standard to govern his decisions, which left Pilate ripe to be used by others to do their bidding. When it comes to Jesus, we all have a decision to make. We must decide to live our lives uh, with Jesus as Lord, Savior, and King. Anything short of living this truth leaves us susceptible to the whims of our sinful flesh, influenced by the culture. The, the regular application of bis- biblical truth makes life so much easier. After God sovereignly gave Pilate information from his wife, Jesus and Jesus' accusers that Jesus was righteous, the Son of God, and a king from another realm. Pilate had enough information to inquire further and decide to release Jesus rather than to flog, mock, and eventually condemn him. But when pleasing the whimsical motives of sinful men dominate our decision process, we will find ourselves bouncing between opinions of sinful people rather than being led by our holy, perfect, and righteous God. The truth is, Jesus is king, whose kingdom is not of this world. He is the Son of God, and he is a righteous man who we should not mistreat. Pilate ignored these facts. He even ignored what he knew unequivocally to be true, and that Jesus was innocent and undeserving of death. But Pilate's rejection of truth made his decision difficult. You see, it's easier to sentence Jesus to die if you reject the, reject the truth of his identity. But Pilate would be fortunate enough to have a do-over. After Jesus is crucified and rises from the grave, Pilate will at least have a chance to come to faith in Jesus. He will have a chance at a redo. The same Jesus whose crucifixion he ordered would provide forgiveness for this and all of Pilate's sins if he just placed his faith in him. In fact, every person we discuss in our text, the chief priests, the servants who arrested Jesus, the elders, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, even the folks who nailed Jesus to the cross would have a chance for forgiveness of their sins. The only one who lost it all and had no hope at this point was Judas because Judas had committed suicide before Jesus died for his sins. So Judas died in his sin. And every person who hears the gospel and does not accept Jesus as Savior and then dies, they die like Judas did in their sins. Without the grace extended by the good shepherd, without the forgiveness offered by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They die without the resurrection and the life. They fail to find the way, the truth, and the life. And since we now have the full account of Scripture, we know the whole story. It seems even more tragic for people to live in disbelief of Scripture in our time today. We have so much more to hang our hats on. We have scripture. We have the empty tomb in Jerusalem. And we have, and this memorializes Jesus' tomb, even in a nation that rejects him. We have the fulfillment of prophecies, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the influence of the disciples who became apostles and continued the spread of the gospel. And if you have any doubts as to where you stand with Jesus, he gives us a simple way for you to know your status. In verse 37, Jesus told us, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Judas, Jesus' accusers, the chief priests, the elders, 
Pilate, Herod, and many others reveal their status because of their failure to listen to Jesus. I ponder the Jewish nation, and I ponder our nation. Yesterday was Palm Sunday, and I can only imagine, go with me for a minute, imagine Jesus on Palm Sunday entering Washington, D.C. in the afternoon in a convertible Honda Accord. Now, I say in accord because remember Jesus' prayer. He wanted all of his disciples to be one. So I figured they would be in one accord. So, all right. But imagine for a minute the church people just getting out of service, and they're lying in the streets, and they're screaming and shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, you know the good old USA. Because of the truth that Jesus represents and the standards of his kingdom versus the lies that our culture has embraced, before Sunday ended, folks would be protesting. And I wonder if by Friday, the voices of the protesters yelling crucify him would drown out the chants of Hosanna just days earlier. And that brings us to our application question. And that is, have you made the decision to listen to the voice of Jesus? Have you made the decision to listen to the voice of Jesus? As we see in John, failure to wholeheartedly follow Jesus as Lord makes us susceptible to follow a lie. Many lies about eternity abound in our culture today. One such lie is there is no God, so we need not concern ourselves about a relationship with a God who does not exist. Lie number two, there is a God, but he doesn't really care about sin, so there is no need for a Savior because God is truly not offended. Lie number three, there is a God, and he cares about sin, but if you sincerely approach him on your own terms or based on any religious teachings or ideology, then he will find you acceptable and you are headed to heaven. This is universalism, that all roads lead to heaven. And then there is the truth, that God is holy, he is perfect, he is righteous, and we are not. And our sinfulness means that we deserve God's just punishment of separation from him. But he loved us so much that he bridged the gap between sinful man and holy God by the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus, on the cross. And if we place our faith in him for the forgiveness of our sins, then we are declared righteous because Jesus is perfectly righteous. He took on our sin, and we take on his righteousness. This is the voice of Jesus. This is biblical truth. Building a life on any other foundation is building your life on a lie, and that has eternal consequences. Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for Jesus. There is no friend like the lowly Jesus, and there is no friend like the resurrected Jesus, and there is no friend like the King Jesus. Lord, I just pray that you bless our time together tonight. We pray for vibrant discussion in the groups, and we pray, Lord, that you are glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.